get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Matt Miller. He's founder of School Spirit Vending. The combined efforts of his businesses and his franchisees' businesses with this allowed them to sell over 5 million stickers last year. They're on track for 7 million this year and they help they do this all by helping schools raise funds. School Spirit Vending has accumulated over 12 million dollars in sales over the past few years. Matt, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thanks for having me on, man. I'm excited to be here. Me too. And so did you ever think you would sell over 12 million dollars worth of stickers? <laughs> no, I, I mean, of course, if you look at my life, I mean, it makes total sense. Anybody could have predicted it that I would have gone from academy grad, Air Force pilot, <laughs> to being a vending operator selling stickers in schools. I mean, isn't that the it's normal a clear you know, path. work path? <laughs> it's a clear path. So, with this journey, um, what were you thinking early on? I mean, if you weren't thinking, okay, I'm going to make $12 million and in stickers. What were you thinking when you first started this? No, dude, I, it was all about survival yeah. for a long, long, long time. You know, we got ourselves in a real hole. Uh, in my corporate career, there were some decisions made my second year in the advertising industry. I ended up being number two in the country out of 700, mm. 750 sales reps. Boss didn't like it. She ended up, uh, increasing my quota 90 plus percent the next year and i went from being a hero to a zero overnight i ended up uh getting myself into a world of hurt financially and and we're set back about eighty thousand dollars a year in commission and bonuses for the next year so we got ourselves into a deep hole and it took a long time to work out yeah that's a tough tough time what did that look like like emotionally what was going on you know because i experienced that factually but well like give me an example of something that was really tough at the time that you think back on and maybe laugh at now well i mean let's face it you know i did pretty well in school i went to the air force academy i was quote unquote america's finest right as an air force pilot yeah and here i am man financially in a place that i never imagined i'd be and there were days where of course i questioned you know what i was doing you know all those types of things because you just don't envision yourself being in that place you know it got so low at one point in time that you know my son and i were literally collecting aluminum cans wow. uh, to keep food on the table i got turned down for a payday loan uh, at one point for just a couple hundred dollars to pay a bill. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to have a credit rating to get a payday loan. Mm. But the challenge is that I had a couple of overdrafts on my bank account, and they had to see a bank statement from the previous month. And in the process, I got turned down. So talk about being lower than low. But But here's what I knew during all that, Jeremy. Mm. I knew that I was better than that. Mm-hmm. And I knew it was situational. It was circumstances, much of which was outside of my control. So I had to get focused on figuring out a solution to get out. Right. And so one of the things I've been blessed with is the opportunity to look longer term and to focus longer term and not to get caught up in all the day-to-day details. Yeah. And and that's what helped us get out of yeah. of that situation. <laughs> Yeah, and Matt, for someone who they may be going through that now or maybe they will go through that, how do you handle that with the family? You know, what do you tell your son when you're collecting aluminum cans? Because that's a tough, <laughs> you know, that's we a were, tough we were pill to swallow. We were blatantly honest. Yeah. Yeah, we were, I mean, we were just blatantly honest and, and we let the kids know. And, 
and we let them know that, hey, there isn't a whole lot of money right now. I, I'll give you an example. I, you know, it's funny. I, <laughs> I'm probably going to start crying here. Pretty sad, but... That anyway, means that means I, I will I will probably start crying too. That <laughs> <laughs> is most likely. <laughs> I, I've never told the story. I don't think on an interview before. Anyway, it got so bad, and and my wife and my three kids' birthdays are all in late August, early September, right all in a row. It got so bad financially that we couldn't afford birthday cake or anything. Mm. So we literally went to the store. And got York peppermint patties, got a couple of candles, and the York peppermint patty ended up being our birthday cake. Wow. And today, we still use that as our birthday cake. I love that. As a reminder of where we were. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough. I appreciate you sharing that because I know people listening either have gone through it or will go through it at some point, and it helps to hear how you handled it. You know, and it sounds like you just you just kind of laid it out there for everyone. That's tough to do. We laid it out there. We got creative, and my kids never saw Dad sitting around looking for a handout or yeah. wondering how it was going to happen. They saw Dad in action yeah. constantly trying to figure it out. Tell me about the transition. I want to go back, and I definitely want to hear some some Air Force stories, but... Tell me about the transition from job to entrepreneur for you. You know, I I left the military because I got sick of being told what to do. And I got to the corporate world thinking it was going to be better. And yeah, I have more, more and it was freedom. Worse. And of course, no, Uncle kidding. Sam completely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Sam completely owns you in the military. At least you, you know, you can do what you want at night with the corporate world or whatever but what i found out was the rules were always changing and they were never in my favor at least with the government i knew what i was going to get paid if it changed it only went up and so there was a lot of stability in that yeah. but i just after taking that big hit financially i knew that i needed to get busy doing something on the outside because the compensation plan i could look at it and see that it was going to be a long time before I could work out of that hole. So I got creative. We did the aluminum can thing. Uh, I found out about selling books, used books on half.com and eBay and Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble. My garage at one point in time during that period looked like a library as I had gone to every library book sale, every Goodwill, every, every anything that I could find used books at and would bring them home and list them online as soon as I could. And then at night, I was packaging books up and taking them to the post office the next day. I mean, we literally did whatever we had to do. Was this while you were working at the, the Velasquez that you were doing this, or was this yes. after? Okay. So then when did you transition yep. full-time to just doing your own thing? Well, I worked at at Velasquez for ten years, wow. and I started uh, in in business about three, two and a half, three years into that. Okay. So it was about a seven year process, yeah. and initially it was just gumballs and candy. Eventually, that m morphed into toys and temporary tattoos and stickers as well. Yeah. And then oh seven and oh eight hit, and the economy tanked, and the numbers plummeted in my locations because people weren't going out to yeah. eat and frequenting those businesses. Yeah. So you much. had those in and restaurants. At that period of time. You had those in restaurants originally. Yep. Restaurants, nail salons, any business that, that would allow me to set up a machine yeah. that had employees and customers coming in on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then 2008 hit. So 2008 hit, I was frustrated because I had about 125 or so locations wow. in the north side of Houston at that point. Yeah. And I had four young kids come knocking on my door in the span of a couple of weeks selling me stuff for local schools. And what I thought that was odd was that I didn't know any of the kids. Their parents weren't with them. And being a father of kids of similar age, I was like, you know, 
In today's day and age, there's no way my kids would be out on the street by themselves going door to door. Right. And I wondered, well, maybe there's a way we could tie what we're doing and vending in with uh, printing and custom stickers and all that and create a passive fundraiser to the school and maybe get some kids off the street. So that's where the whole idea came from. And, uh, you know, so you got into to the day and it's worked out. So, man, I mean, what's impressive is you got into 125 locations before that, right? So tell me your sales pitch to the restaurant owner. Do you still remember it? I would just walk in and say, hey, I'm Matt Miller uh, of Mars Vending. I own a vending company, and I noticed that you have some extra space here near the front of the restaurant. Um, I've got a neat little vending setup with some toys and some, some gumballs and all that that we could set up here at no charge to you guys. Take advantage of that space and allow your customers to, to benefit from from it being there it would help you attract some more kids into your location as well and uh it would do a revenue share give you a percentage of what comes out of the machine all you've got to do is be willing to let me set up shop here and I'll, I'll pay you every time i come by and service it so what obstacles do you get from them typically yeah there's some some owners that just don't want you know a vending machine cluttering the front of their restaurant or whatever uh, there's a few that have been burned by other operators previously that just didn't want any part of it, um, or you know, space. The quote unquote, you know, lack of space was oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, brought up. Though, I mean, the the equipment is not that large. In most cases, the stuff I was setting up was no more than three feet wide and maybe, you know, three and a half, four feet tall. So not super big, but you know. When somebody isn't interested in following along, they'll find they'll find a reason. excuse will do. Right. Yeah. So, how did you f figure out or decide on what percentage to share with them? You know, the industry standard is anywhere typically between twenty-five and forty percent, and it really kind of depended on the location, where they were, and quite honestly, how savvy the owner was, and and. Um, you know, if they were used to negotiating and all that, you know, they typically got a little bit higher uh, commission. I was able to work out some some one-off deals with some of them, uh, you know, where I do other things for them in exchange for a lower percentage or whatever. Right. But uh, you know, every every location was different, and we handled it as such. Yeah, you know, Matt, what I love about your story is, you know, there's a grind. There's a seven-year grind before you even get out of the corporate world. And you're just knocking on doors and selling, you know, and that's what I love to hear. And I want to go back to your pilot days for a second. First of all, you were in the Air Force. That's hardcore. So what made you decide to go in the Air Force? Well, once again, this was not something that was predicted or predictable. I, I got to my junior year in high school. I had done extremely well. I was an active, or I was, you know, in the top ten of my class. I uh, was in twelve different musicals and plays. I lettered in football and track all four years. I sang in several choirs, and I worked about twenty hours a week as a supervisor at a local burger and uh, ice cream joint. You were a little junior and senior, a little busy. So yeah, just a little bit busy, and so a good buddy of mine, dad met my dad and I one Saturday at an art show. My mom and dad are both artists and uh, dad had a set up there and his buddy came by and we got to talk and he asked me what my plans were and I said, you know, to be honest, I don't know. And he said, well, have you ever heard of the Air Force Academy? And I said, no. He said, well, it's kind of like West Point or Annapolis, but it's for the Air Force. It's out in Colorado Springs and you should check it out. And so I got, uh, well, there wasn't any online at the time. I, I I think he had some information sent to me, uh, a catalog and all that. I, I kind of checked it out, and mom and dad and I decided that spring to go out and visit the academy. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, except for I knew I wanted to go to school away from home. I wanted an opportunity to go and experience life 
I grew up in a little town called Sycamore, Illinois, and mm. Northern Illinois University. Right. Well, both my parents went uh, to Northern would, Illinois. Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, so both mine did too. Mm. And that was my playground in high school. So I didn't want to go to NIU. I wanted to go someplace different. And yeah. mom and dad were both teachers. And when I was a senior in high school, each of us were in a different grade. And they basically told us early on, guys, if you're going to go to college, you're going to have to make your own way. Right. So I knew that going in. And the academy ended up being a way for me to go to school away from home and have it paid for. Yeah. I had no aspirations to be a pilot, aspirations really to be an officer in the military. It was just my ticket to go to school elsewhere. Yeah. And so that's what ended up happening. Interestingly enough, it was a major, major rude awakening when I got off the bus that Why? first day of basic training. What did you see? In July of 85. Just because I, no, I had no exposure to the military, whatever. I had no family members. <laughs> No, uh, so I had nobody to share, and when this sharp-dressed guy in a uniform gets on the bus with a smile on his face and starts barking out orders, um, I knew my life had just changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the biggest shock when you first, uh, just I guess overall, being in the Air Force? Well, just the, just the fact that they take away your your total identity early on, and what do you they mean? tear you down yeah. to the absolute. I mean, they shave your head. Everybody wears the same uniform. Right. They don't let you talk. Yeah, I mean, all you're doing is marching around at attention, following orders, saying yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, yes ma'am, and that's about it. And for the first several months that was what it was the training before the academic year started. I mean, that's what life was. Yeah. You know, here I go from being a free senior in high school, well known in the community, did my own thing, dated, you know, all that kind of stuff to all of a sudden I am totally at the whim of the leadership and what they wanted me to do. And I wasn't prepared for that. Yeah. I want to talk about this in the Air Force. So what's the craziest story you experienced being in the Air Force? Wow, there's so many. You know, I would say that the craziest was we would regularly have international students that would come through and we would have to train them in as pilots. And as an instructor pilot, uh, I remember one pilot training class, we had several uh, princes, uh, Kuwaiti princes that mm. were part of our class. And I'll never forget one flight. Uh, we flew formation the majority of the time when I was instructing in the, in the T-38. And yeah. a lot of that is, you know, three foot fingertip formation. And I'll never forget. I had a solo Kuwaiti student on my wing and then I had a Kuwaiti student in the in the jet with me. Mm -hmm. So it's me and two Kuwaiti students. English is their second language. Mm -hmm. And both really, really good guys. But I'll never forget, this is the first time one of them had gone solo on the wing in formation. And, and he called for what we call a pitch out. And there's different hand signals that we use to, to show that. Mm -hmm. So he's there side by side with us. He calls for a pitch out. Well, you, as the lead, you're supposed to pull away from the number two aircraft. Right, right. Well, he turned he turned into us. Oh, my God. And I, I, I mean, I had to go full forward stick. We missed his jet probably by a foot or less. Wow. And, you know... Well, it's probably the closest I ever came to dying oh my in God. that situation as well. But you just you just never knew what to expect. I always joked that you know <laughs> students were trying to kill me on a daily basis. Oh God, for five I don't want to get up there because they students. just didn't know what they were doing. Right? right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so he he. I mean, that's a pretty big mess up, though. Right. I mean, is that yeah common? Yeah. Uh not super common, but. Yeah. Um, you know, it happens enough. You know, he obviously failed that ride and uh, like kicked out and of had the, to be go back out. and do it yeah. again. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> um, 
some a lot of near-death experience it sounds like um with Velasis. you know what i find it interesting is it's a targeted direct mail company right correct yeah so what are some of the campaigns that you saw because you were working with big companies like midas chick-fil-a what are some of the campaigns you really cut your teeth on direct marketing what did you see working well, I mean, the biggest thing I saw in all that, Jeremy, is is learning the fact that marketing takes time, it takes commitment, and you can't just try something once and right. pass judgment on whether it works or not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, marketing is a progressive thing that takes time. You know, we used to always talk about what we called the rule of threes, mm -hmm. which meant you know, a customer typically had to see your message at least three times right. before they even recognized or start to pay attention to one's ad mm -hmm. or brand. So you had to get out there and you had to do stuff on a regular basis. And so it was teaching customers that because many of them were just purely focusing on the budget today and mon what money they were going to spend today, not long planning, which is where success really comes but I spent a lot of time working on making win-win situations. Mm -hmm. And whereas a lot of other folks in the office were just purely focused on the dollar, how much could they sell, what kind of revenue could they do, I really focused on putting together programs that I knew were going to win yeah. and that were going to be wildly successful. Yeah. What's one of the And in the process... Mm -hmm. And in the process, these guys would keep coming back for more. And so my retention rate for clients was very, very high. Yeah. Another thing that I did that was unique is my sweet spot was working with small business owners, mm -hmm. you know, from one to say six, eight, ten locations mm -hmm. to where I was literally sitting down and meeting with the owner and the decision maker right. in one person. Right. I wasn't whining and dining. I wasn't playing the whole big corporate game. Go talk to this guy this week. Now we got to go talk to this guy. You know, the corporate employees are wanting to be wined and dined because they, you know, their company doesn't do enough for them as it is. They're used to it. And a lot yeah. of those guys spent a lot of time just sucking up to people and playing the game. And I didn't want to play the game. I'm not a politician. I, I, I you know, I was looking for results. And because mm -hmm. of that, I was able to, to not run as high in numbers as a lot of people, but I had a very stable book of business, and I was able to own my life, uh, and I was always a top performer because I built a solid foundation that I grew off of every year instead of, hey, we got this big client this year, and then next year that they're not around yeah. anymore. Yeah. So, Matt, tell me about one of the winning programs that you're proud of that helped basically make one of these businesses probably a lot of money? Well, uh, you know, Midas and Chick-fil-A, both of which that you mentioned, I was wildly successful with. I, yeah. I actually worked with Midas for, man, probably seven, eight years wow. with the owners around Texas yeah. and our part of the country. Yeah, so what'd you do for them? Yeah, probably, for Midas. What'd you do for Midas? We just put together a, a very, very targeted campaign. We, we uh, analyzed their top zip codes mm -hmm. and the demographics in those zip codes. Mm -hmm. And then we put together a campaign to where they literally had new direct mail out on the street every week. Mm -hmm. So I would sit down and we put together a three-month campaign. They'd give me a budget. I'd run all the numbers and, and do all the number crunching and then come back to them and say, okay, this is our plan. I'd put together a spreadsheet. They'd know exactly where the mailings were going each week. And we would rotate through different zip codes, those top zip codes, mm -hmm. along with other zip codes that were similar zip codes in their area mm -hmm. that maybe they hadn't done a whole lot of marketing with yet. Right. And it ended up being a win. It allowed me to be running business on a weekly basis with these guys. It allowed them to have always have direct mail on the street so they had new customers coming in all the time. <clears throat> 
And it was a wildly successful campaign to where these guys kept coming back wanting to spend more and more money because the response they got, you know, allowed them to make significantly more money than what they were spending with me. Yeah, it pays for itself. And I don't want to breeze over this because this, this is um, there's a lot of moving parts here, right? Because you have to have a you focus on a demographic, then you have to have a, a specific list that you send it to, and then you have to have like copy that actually converts and then they have to service those those calls um did you already have a list to send this out to like in the certain zip codes or do you work with separate companies for that yeah our company had proprietary database mm -hmm. we did something called shared mail mm -hmm. so it wasn't individual mailings like a postcard okay. you might get in your mailbox it, it's it was a grouping of like a of val pack ads. type yes, of thing yes okay yeah in and so yeah. We were able to to do very targeted mailings, but at a much cheaper price mm -hmm. than that postcard going out all by itself. Right. Because all the advertisers together were paying for the postage together instead right. of each individual right. advertiser having. Yeah. Paid. Yeah, I asked too because I, you know we're going to talk about you have franchisees and you use this marketing know how to help them get into more. Uh, locations as well and so what worked as far as the copy goes what was one of those uh oh yeah we included this on the i don't know if it was like a postcard size you know campaign for midas or what was working as far as the copy i, I don't remember specific copy but i do know uh you know coupons were obviously a big part of it mm -hmm. e expiration dates mm -hmm. were very very important mm -hmm. And the other thing is that I found over the years that that a percentage off isn't nearly as successful mm. as an actual dollar amount quoted. Got it. <clears throat> so I was I was actually working the other day with with my personal trainer and he's putting together a new program and he was asking me about this and that and and he had a percentage of discount for the specific group that he was working with. Right. And I told him I said Jeff I said you can do what you want. And 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 I know you're just kind of sharing work. this with me. No, I'm just but kidding. if you want to be more effective, yeah. you need to put an actual dollar amount yeah. on that. Yeah. Because people in their mind, they don't really see themselves saving a percentage. Mm -hmm. You know, they they see, hey, I saved fifty dollars by doing this now and using this right. coupon or whatever, right. and that has a lot more value. See, I knew you'd have a good one for that, Matt. With all these companies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, even before 2008 hit and those kids came to your door and you're like, I need to do something different. I need to go into schools. What made you first get into the gumball and these, these units going into restaurants anyways? Well, I had mentioned earlier that I had done kind of whatever I had to do to, yeah. to put food on the table. But I had read Robert Kiyosaki's book previously, Jeremy, mm -hmm. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I bought into Kiyosaki's message about passive income. Yeah. And I didn't have money to do it in real estate, which is how he started out. Of course, now he makes it passively in a lot of ways, including books and courses and events and all that stuff. Right. But... <clears throat> I saw what he did and what he talked about, so I measured everything that I was doing against his passive income thought process mm, and model. Got it. And none of them were meeting that, though they were keeping the roof over our head at the time. Yeah. And I had a good buddy at church one Sunday who mentioned he and his young daughters had bought a couple of gumball machines, and he had spent time teaching them about business, and they had, had set them up in local area, a couple of banks, I think, if I remember right. And it was a way they could make money, and it was something they could do together. And I remember that conversation. I was like, you know, gumballs are only 25 cents, so mm -hmm. there's not a lot of money there. Right. But – there's a huge profit margin, number one. And number two, the machine does all the selling. Right. And I don't have to be there. So that was where I decided to take a plunge because I didn't have a lot of money. I had about 100 bucks at the time that I could have put towards something. Right. I spent 25 of that or so on a couple of ebooks on Amazon. And then I bought a used candy and gumball machine on eBay from a guy across Houston that I picked up one Saturday morning in my. 98 Honda Honda Accord with my 
uh, two oldest kids. Got to love the Honda Accord. And filled it with some candy yeah. and gumballs. Yeah. Heck yeah, yeah. And we got started. And I'll never forget, normally those those machines, you know, you don't have to go back, but every four to six to eight weeks. Well, I was chomping at the bit to find out how well it did and if this whole vending thing was going to work like I hoped it would. Mm -hmm. After two weeks, I couldn't hold back anymore. I went by the karate studio where I set the machine up, right. and, man, the thing was overflowing with quarters. And I wow. was like, holy smokes, I <laughs> something. In fact, that machine... That machine was paid for within two months, wow. and I was able to continue to cash flow more and more and more machines over time. You know, and and that's kind of how it all came together. What? Um, how much does a new one typically cost? Like you bought one used. If you went and got the new new one, what's what's the range that it costs? You know, I was buying cheap equipment that I found out later was, was made overseas, mm -hmm. uh, probably in Asia somewhere. But there's some very, very reputable companies that, you know, you kind of got the, you know, the Honda or the Acura model mm -hmm. and which, or a gumball machine with the stand and everything, you're probably looking at $125 or so. And okay. then you've got the Cadillac who, you know, add another 30 or $40 to that if you're looking at really, really high dollar locations. So, you know, anywhere between 120 to to $200 probably delivered okay. and, and, you know, gumballs and everything. So not a ton of money. Of course, you can find equipment, uh, you know, used. And that's what I did to start with. that was much cheaper. Mm -hmm. And even though later on I found out the equipment I had was sub substandard and it tended to have problems, it still accomplished what i needed it to at the time right so that was a huge milestone right you go back two weeks later it's empty you're overflowing with quarters what was the next major milestone you hit with the uh vending you know i'd say the next major milestone was when i decided to venture into stickers mm. i had heard about stickers I, I was like yeah i don't know i've never bought a sticker in a vending machine but i was willing to give it a try i went back to ebay again i found a guy i was in houston I why found a guy stickers up in Tulsa, what made you even think of doing stickers in the first place because I was already doing toys and temporary uh -huh. tattoos and that other stuff, and, and stickers were kind of the was kind of the next it was also, progression I gotcha. in, in bulk vending. Yeah. So anyway, I found a guy up in Tulsa who had two brand new machines on sale. They had been in his warehouse for a couple of years. He had gotten them at a trade show. The vendor had brought them in, put set them up, and didn't want to ship them back to their warehouse. So they would initially they would basically give them away for whatever they could get for them yeah. so that they wouldn't have to worry about paying the shipping back. Yeah. And so this guy picked them up and never used them. So I ended up doing some research, found out how much that they would cost on the open market new, um, and was able to get the machines for about $350 at the time, which was what one of them new cost. Mm. Well, I didn't have I didn't have a whole lot of money. So how in the heck am I going to make that happen? Well, what I ended up doing, Jeremy, is I took a picture, one of the ones off this guy's listing, of the machine that I didn't like the look of. Mm -hmm. And before I made the trek up to Tulsa from Houston, which is about a nine-hour trip, wow. I listed that, that other machine on uh, eBay myself. I love this. found a yeah. buyer in Houston that paid me 350 bucks for it. Wow. So. So I essentially got the other machine for free minus my time and my mm. drive up to Tulsa and back one Saturday. So I had the machines paid for by selling the one wow. before I even left. Drove up there, got a chance to talk with a guy for a while. He had been in the industry forever, gave me some insights and referred me to a yeah. Yahoo group that was going on at the time. Yeah. And I came back and, and that was the beginning of my sticker journey. That that machine is still in one of my schools today, really? uh, producing, <clears throat> and here it's you know what eleven or twelve years later, and uh, it's it, pretty wild. But that was a huge turning point just because I saw the benefit and the value of of the sticker product, and that's where I ultimately 
obviously turned and decided to run with. So what was the good advice that he gave you or the, the Yahoo group gave you early on that helped? You know, a lot of it wasn't really advice. Well, there was one event that they recommended I go to that I went to that, that got me plugged in and got me even more information. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, a lot of it actually was negative motivation, meaning, really? you know, I'd bring up a new idea or a question or whatever, and all the guys that had been around for a while would do nothing but bad mouth it and poo poo it and, and tell me why it wouldn't work. And along the way, I built up a little bit of uh, animosity, not towards them individually, but towards the attitude that they had. Mm -hmm. And I was bound and determined to figure it out and bound and determined to be much more successful than any of those guys ever could dream to be um, in my own way. And mm -hmm. so I learned what I needed to learn, and then I went out on my own doing my own thing, and that's where SSV started and came from, and and uh, you know it's crazy to see what we've accomplished and how far we've come in the last eight and a half years. Yeah, that is amazing. And that fuels people. It fuels you to, you know, not go with the norm, not go with people are saying they think is not going to work. Um, so how did you get to place that first sticker uh, unit? I had a good buddy of mine who we had done some business together previously. He and his wife had come over for dinner one night and I was sharing with him a little bit about what my thoughts were and ideas about working with the schools after those kids had come knocking on my door. And he was an elementary PE teacher at a little school district in a little school down in West Columbia, uh, West Columbia, Texas, southwest of Houston, about an hour and a half. And so I shared with him my idea. He said, you know, let me talk to my principal and PTO and see what they think. And a couple went, weeks went by, I didn't really think any more of it, and he came back and he said, hey, they said, let's give it a try, bring mm. a machine down. So we scrambled to get some custom stickers put together for the school and design those and get them printed. And then we took a machine down and started testing, and the machine just blew my mind. And so that was kind of the start of it all. I went from there back to doing what I had done in restaurants and all that, going door to door, and talked to a bunch of schools in my local area, and they just, and they kind of, the whole little puppy dog approach, kind of pat me on the head and tell me it was a great idea and that they'd think about it. But I could just tell, you know, by their verbal and nonverbal communication mm -hmm. that they were not early adopters and that they weren't going to do anything with it. So several months later, I was just super frustrated, wondering what the heck the next step should be, because we knew this thing would work, and happened to do some searching online, found the Texas PTA was having an event, and Jeremy, the guy who got me in his school, and another friend, Shane, who uh, <clears throat> I had taught vending the couple years previous, and I decided to share the cost of a table and set up shop and see what happened and so we had a couple of weeks to get a logo put together get some cheesy t-shirts made we had our two spirit stickers were sitting there on this big eight foot long table along with some information pads to collect information and we showed up at that event having no clue what we were doing but had an idea and we wanted to float it to see what people thought and out of that event we had 10 pto moms that are PTA moms that got just flat out excited about what we mm. were doing and we were off to the races. So what's most compelling for the school that basically a percentage goes back to the school, right? Yeah, it's a revenue share. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do any work. We do all the work. It ends up being a passive fundraiser for them, which is a big deal because, you know, money is always tight. There's always need for more and volunteers are always very very hard to come by so we step in and fulfill the role of of some volunteers and literally do all the work and just cut them a check every month mm. so at what point do you decide you're going to franchise this 
I had we set up a distributor and and licensing licensing model for the first seven years or so, and I started working with a guy by the name of Aaron Walker as my business and life coach here about eighteen months ago, and. I'll never forget, this was uh, I don't know, about 14 months ago, Aaron called me up for our weekly coaching call one day, and he said, you know, Romeo, call me Romeo, because <laughs> at the beginning, I wasn't dating my wife, and so um, I started dating her, I mean, I started taking her out on a regular basis, and but the, but the nickname stuck, so... He was like, you know, Romeo, I've been doing some research, and there are a heck of a lot of schools out there that you guys aren't in yet. And it seems to me the only reason why you're not in them is because they don't know about you yet. So why don't we get our act together and get after this thing and go find some more people to help us grow in some of the areas of the country where we're not? And from there, I started doing some research on how to do that more effectively, found out that the marketing costs and all that were, were going to be pretty expensive, and decided that um, I was going to need to do something different in order to make that work. And after consulting with my attorney uh, and and he consulting with a couple other guys in his firm, he got back to me February, so uh, actually a year ago this month, and said, you know, Matt, we've been doing a lot of thinking and some research. And based on what you're doing, what you want to do, and the places where you want to go, you really need to be a franchise. Because really? Because a, uh, a lot of the states where we weren't have much more restrictive uh, business regulations and guidelines mm -hmm. and require registration for businesses like ours, et cetera. So... That kind of got the ball rolling. It's not on the radar at all. I I wasn't planning for it. I didn't have a reserve at the time to make that happen, but we did, and so we became a, formally a franchise here in July of 2015, and have been growing like a weed ever since. Um, our story really really resonates with people, professionals who are looking to diversify outside of their full time income on a limited time commitment and also people or parents who want to develop a business maybe for the first time themselves and teach entrepreneurship to their kids along the way. Mm -hmm. And since we focus on family business and, and raising up families and multi-generations of entrepreneurs, you know, there's a huge group of people out there that would like to do something and do it with their kids and and that's where a lot of our franchisees are coming from today yeah that's amazing so how do you structure your franchise model how do you mean i mean you know um as far as when someone comes on board how does it work we've got a you know in in-depth training process you know, with eight and a half years of experience, we've kind of been there, done that, got the T-shirt, and have made all the mistakes just about that one could make. So we've got a face-to-face -face, um, training that they go through here in Texas, and then we have an online training that supplements that as well. We also have a mentorship program where we send somebody out, one of the veterans on our team who's been around the block, to spend a couple of days with them actually in their territory, helping get the ball rolling and show them early success and demystify what we're doing. And, uh, you know, we've got a ramp up time that is very, very quick because of that. And we've got a, a bunch of new folks in the last six months that have gotten started and are tearing this thing up already because of, of the training that we've put in place. What's your goal for them or their goal for themselves? Typically how many, units do they want to get in like their first year because i could see that's like a, a big ramp up process that you help them with right get into different uh, locations you know it's really up to them and what their goals are one of my thoughts and this is kind of different than a lot of businesses out there but th there's no quotas you know there's no pressure from the top uh, I hated that when I was in sales, and so we intentionally don't have that here. My goal is for this to be a blessing for people, and if it is, then they need to grow at their own pace. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we don't do some ins- things to incent folks along the way. That doesn't mean that we don't help and encourage them um, and show them how they might be able to do more than what they ever thought they could. But ultimately, it's up to them, and there's no pressure um, you know, for them to do more than what they're really prepared to do. I, I learned once again early on, going back to my time at Velasquez, that if I create a win-win situation, and if I'm willing to go out and talk to enough people to do what I need to do to provide for my family, then there's no need for me to put pressure on anybody else to go do something that they're not ready or willing to do. And so I'm the hardest working guy on the team, at least currently, and was the same very, very early on because I know what I need to do. I know what my personal goals are, and I can go out and do what I need to do and not have to put any pressure on anybody to do what I feel that they need to do. I'll just I'll make it happen, and they can grow at whatever pace they choose. Yeah, so you mentioned um, obviously what they're buying with you is a system that works and you put that system together because you made some mistakes that they can avoid. What's one mistake that you hit home with them to avoid? You know, I think one of the things is just the importance of Mm follow-up. Early on, the three of us that got started, we were working full-time. This was being done on the side. We didn't have a whole lot of extra time, so we had to get really creative. And if somebody didn't respond after a trade show or something like that to to an email or two, we would just kind of blow it off because there was plenty of others that were raising their hand that we didn't have to chase or didn't have to continually follow up with. Well, we've learned over the years that there are a lot more schools, a lot more locations that with patience will come around and that a relationship and some persistent is often persistence is oftentimes required. So we've gotten a lot better at teaching that and learned a lot along the way in that regard. Mm -hmm. What are some of the common questions you get from the potential franchisees before they come on board? You know, how much money can we make? You know, what's what's the ultimate upside? You know, some of those things, believe it or not, I can't share with them. As the franchisor, um, the government has very strict regulations on what can be said and not said. Oh, really? So some of those things they have to wait. Yeah, some of those things they have to actually have to get far enough along in the process to talk to some of our existing franchisees. Mm. And they can answer all those questions because they're not the, the franchisor. But, um, you know, a lot of it is me, okay, how much it time is this going to take? It makes me want to ask, like, so how much money How much money is it? And you're going to tell me I can't, I can't say. Um, we're going to have to phone in one of the franchises. I, I, could, no, I'm just, I, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you, Jeremy. Oh, yeah. So. I know your Air Force <laughs> training. You probably could. <laughs> um, but it's, I mean, that's a legitimate question. So if they're far enough, enough along in the process, then they, you know, talk with you and, and another owner and then they have to kind of do their due diligence. Is that how it works? Yeah, they, uh, once they get about two thirds of the way through the process, the, the franchise has been presented to them with a franchise disclosure document and we've answered all their questions there, then they have an opportunity to contact anybody, any of our franchisees to pick their brains. And because the franchisees aren't the ones selling a franchise, they can share with them all the details that they see Mm -hmm. in their business that I can't. Um, So that's where they get that information. That also allows us to protect our existing franchisees so that they're not being hounded and called by you know, some brand new person who knows nothing about what we do yet, asking a bunch of silly questions that that the interview process will go through and get answered for them along the way. Yeah. Are you allowed to talk to them about the range that each unit makes in a month? 
No. No, not at all. But they can get it from the franchisees. Mm. Um, yeah, anything money related uh, as far as performance or location averages, any of that, you know, we can't talk about. But like I said, we've been doing this for eight and a half years. We've got a team approaching 50 franchisees. Um, they're not here and not making money. If they weren't making money, they wouldn't be around. So we've got a viable model. They just need to understand that they'll get that information. It's just further along in the process because right. of the way the government uh, guidelines, you know, limit us in, in some of the stuff we can discuss. Yeah, because then people are making crazy claims or something. And th- yeah, there's then- been people in the past that there's been people in the past that have unfortunately, you know, tried to feed people numbers that aren't real in, in the effort to sell franchises. And right. so this is Uncle Sam's way of of preventing that. Yeah. So Matt, what's the investment required from someone? It depend. It depends on if somebody wants a, a single territory or two territories. Um, the Franchise fee and mentorship program is about eighty, or excuse me, about ninety seven hundred dollars to get started. Okay. That gets them a territory of, of two hundred schools, and also the mentorship program, and then equipment for five schools, and uh, all the marketing materials, the the product, the customization, all that that all that that they need uh, is about another seven thousand. So um, it's you know what. 16 to 17,000 mm-hmm. on the low end. Mm-hmm. If somebody wants to acquire a second territory early on, there's a 10% discount for that. And and now they're they go from um from about 17,000 to uh what about 23 or so. Um so very very inexpensive on the franchise front. You know, the average uh, franchise in America today is about 125 grand. Yeah, it's expensive. So, um, very low cost, comparatively speaking. And with the 125,000, there's usually a lot of overhead with that. You know, like you're talking building employees oh, yeah, and other things. You know, on top of that. Yep. Um, Many of our teams start this as a solopreneur to begin with, and then they build it from there. So what do people get most excited about when they come on board as a franchise um, from the marketing perspective and getting out there? What do they come back to you and say, wow, like, Matt, this is, this is really helping? Well, most people that have come to the team, many of them have never owned a business before. Many of them have never, quote, unquote, sold anything before. Mm-hmm. So when they come back, and, and see how easy it is and that this how excited many of the locations get mm-hmm. they get pretty excited too mm-hmm. um, because it's not this big boogeyman that a lot of people make it out to be and when they understand how to position what we do and explain it people get excited about it so what's the hardest part about your business and then I want to hear the hardest part about the fran- what the franchisees say is the hardest. The hardest part about my business is is managing a very rapid growing com- com- uh, company that is decentralized all over the U.S. and soon to be you know in other countries as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that, I mean that's the, the biggest challenge. You know I don't have but a couple of people who are local to me here in central Texas. So everybody else is at a distance. And so learning how to manage that group, learning how to effectively communicate with that group, et cetera, is the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I launched Jeremy here about, uh, I guess it's about eight months ago was I launched an internal podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I may be the first one ever. I haven't heard of any others, but you know, they talk about niching down your audience as much as possible. Well, there's no more niche audience than me, me podcasting twice a week to 50 franchisees. School vending. Um, in a private format. School spirit vending yeah, podcast. So, what is the podcast? Yep. 
It's called SSV Radio. Okay. And we do s- several different things. We do interviews of franchisees, yeah. success stories, share best practices, and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also bring outside guests on and have them share their expertise in areas and industries that that are relevant to our team. And then I do something called SSV Tips, which is a short five to ten minute episode every Thursday mm-hmm. where I drill down on a very specific topic and, and just talk about it for five to ten minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, that has been a huge home run for us because I've got people contacting me all the time now saying, man, I just listened to so-and-so's interview and I never thought of it this way. Right. Or, or hey, I just heard that guy. Can I talk to him because he's got a system that I would really like to try for myself. It just brings us all closer together. Yeah. It builds our community and helps us develop relationships despite the fact that we're all our own business owners spread all over the country. Yeah, that's so smart. So what's been your favorite success story? We, we had one guy that got started, Air Force retiree. Um, if you met the guy, you know, nothing special, you know, really kind of understated, you know, pretty quiet. But he added over a hundred schools in his first year. Wow! And just blew blew things out of the water. And he's kind of the Roger Bannister of SSV so far. <laughs> you know, Roger Roger Bannister was right. the first one to break the four minute mile. Well, he was the first one to in to one place a hundred schools in a year. And everybody's aspiring to be that guy now. So, how does he service all of those? Because he has to go there, right, uh, to each location, or is he, does he have uh, like a staff that helps him with these? That's a lot of locations. Well, he's got route drivers now, but I mean, our our machines are set to where, you know, they only have to be seen so often. So, you know, you go service for a number of days, take care of your locations, and then there's, you know, several weeks that you really don't have anything to do until you go back and do it again. And once you get big enough, you know, you potentially hire some folks to help out with that so that uh, so that you're not actually the one that's that's in the middle of the business all the time, but is actually working on it. Yeah. Yeah. And Matt, when you for people listening, if you know, you're mentioning SSV radio on SSV, if you go to SSVbusiness.com, that's where you talk about the school spirit vending franchise opportunities, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, okay. And then people can go to um, schoolspiritvending.com for your your actual business, right? Yeah, that, that's yeah. that's where our schools learn about us mm-hmm. is at schoolspiritvending.com. Okay. Um, so what's the hardest part for France? So yours is obviously managing this, this growth, right? Um, does that come with hiring people? How do you How do you manage it at this point? Well, it's a, it's a matter of finding efficiencies and using as many tools as there are out there available to to manage uh, that group of people. But then it's also in the last year been bringing key players onto the team and going from being a solopreneur to to owning a business with with an entire support team that is decentralized. Also, in fact, nobody you know on our support team lives here local to me Hmm. um, within 30 minutes and and many are spread across the country. And, you know, it it, it has its own challenges, but it's also very nice because everybody kind of gets to work their own schedule and fit this into the cracks of their life. Just like I was able to fit vending into the cracks of my life. Yeah. And it gives people flexibility and uh, the ability to work from home in most cases, and once again, ends up being a win-win for them and and for for SSV and our team as well. So, what's man? What's the hardest part for the franchisees off the bat that you see? You know, it's probably capital, just because many of them don't start out with any business, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, because of that, they just don't have a bunch of money sitting in the bank. Right. So. It's working through that growth initially for the first year to year and a half, typically until the business is big enough to where it's cash flow in itself um, is the hardest 
but once that foundation gets laid, um, you know, this thing keeps doing its thing month after month out and gets to be pretty easy at that point. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how you started early on, you know, just bootstrapping it. Yep. Um, so we already talked about this, Matt, you know, since it's inspired insider, I always ask about the low point and how you push through and the proudest moment. And we talked a little, I mean, about one of the low points, which is around the birthdays. At that point, when you had to go and get peppermint patties, and that's what you used, how did you push through that time when that's what you were going through? I looked at this as building a brick wall, Jeremy, and I knew that my income was directly related to the number of machines I had out on the street. Yeah. And so if I wasn't where I needed to be at the time, I could be, all I had to do is keep going back and doing what I did the first time with another machine in another location over and over and over and over again. And eventually step by step, I worked, I built that brick wall of income and I worked us out of our hole. Yeah. And then when I came upon an idea that all kinds of people around me got excited about and wanted to be a part of, I realized that, wow, it's it doesn't just have to be me doing the work anymore. I've got something here that has value that I can teach others. <clears throat> In exchange for teaching them, I can get some benefit from what they do too, originally with the distributor model and licensing and of course it's grown from there but you know initially it was okay i got enough money to go buy another machine i went and bought another machine got the stuff to put in it and then found a location and then i went to get another machine and another and another and a lot of people out there because of our microwave society today probably would have a challenge building it that way but i didn't have any choice Right. So I was forced to be patient, even though patience is not in my vocabulary normally. Right. Do people, um, your franchisees, still only go after schools, or do they place them in other places as well? Uh, we do locations, uh, primarily schools, but you know they've got the ability to place equipment wherever they want to. Yeah. Um, so the proudest moment. What's been the proudest moment? You know, aside from seeing my newest, uh, uh, the new people on the team get their first locations on their own, I think my proudest moment was, um, you know, the first trade show that we did when I had this crazy idea. We had one school that was willing to give it a try. Right. And the confirmation that what we were doing was unique and special by those 10 PTA moms who, who wanted to implement our program in their schools. Yeah. What about fast forward today, something selfish you're proud of? Like you went from, you know, collecting aluminum clamp cans. What do you, you know, do today that you think back and go, wow, like I've come so far from that time? Uh, you know, to be able to pay cash for my kids' school. Mm-hmm. And to know that they're going to college and will mm-hmm. not have any student loans when they get done. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, is, is a huge thing for us um, because my parents weren't able to do that for me, obviously. And it was something that we really wanted to do yeah. <clears throat> for our kids so that they would potentially have six figures of debt that yeah. they started out there, you know, <laughs> right out on their own with. So we've been able to, uh, to thus far, been blessed to, to be able to take care of school for my oldest and our second uh, start school here this next uh, fall. And uh, how old's your that's, oldest? I think the biggest thing. Hey, he's oh. nineteen. Oh, cool. Okay. So where's he going? He goes to Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. Cool. All right. So does he tell you what he wants to do? Uh, he's majoring in uh, 
economics with a minor in graphic design. He actually was our first graphic designer at 10 years old. Really? And so he has oh, spent cool. the last, yeah, he spent the last nine years learning graphic design um, as part of our business initially. And then uh, now he does business and, and helps out companies with web design and app design as well as graphic stuff. He's already cut his teeth and, for uh, a decade. So we were able to, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And he's really, really, really talented. So it's pretty, pretty cool to have been just a little part and, you know, provided the environment for him to do that. Yeah. Matt, this has been really valuable. I appreciate you sharing these stories because they, they can't be easy to share because um, they really hit close to the heart. Um, so I have one last question, but before I ask it, just tell people. Uh, where they can find you. And I know you have a really awesome free resource for people too. Yeah, so they can reach me, Jeremy, at Matt, M-A-T-T, at SSVbusiness.com. Or um, if they'd like, I've got a free ebook uh, for download for your audience. Um, they can go to SSVbusiness.com forward slash insight, or excuse me, forward slash inspired mm -hmm. and it, the ebook's called live your dreams the top 10 reasons why you need to own a vending business and i just shed a little bit of light on the value of having a vending business um it has nothing to do with our franchise per se but it'll at least give folks some insights into vending in general and if they'd like to reach out and ask questions just about about vending or if they'd like to reach out and talk more specifically about ssv and and helping schools in their area. I'd love to chat with them about that as well. Thanks, Matt. So people should definitely check out that resource. We'll link it up. And then also SSVbusiness.com where you can find out more about that. Um, so last question, Matt, and comic books. So you have a comic book company, right? <laughs> we didn't talk yeah. about this yes, at all. Yes, I do. So, I mean, fun fact, which I didn't mention in the beginning – but you um, actually were in a school play and played Superman tights and all, and you have a comic book <laughs> business. So, <laughs> I want a picture of that for, yeah, so the, was, for this post. Do you have a picture of that somewhere? Of you? In I think that? my parents had that. Well, I want it scanned and emailed to me <laughs> for this. <laughs> If I can find it, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll have to check with my mom and dad. I'm pretty sure they've got one somewhere. I want that. But, yeah. Um, yeah, my my, se my senior year in high school, yeah, I played Superman in the musical Superman and had the the uh, tights and, and everything. Um, as far as the comic book stuff, yeah, I was inspired to read early on in my life by reading comic books. Mm. And when I got older and we started doing work in schools and all that, I was like, you know what? I not only have an obligation here to, to teach our team how to make money and to help schools raise money, but I really feel like I've got an obligation to give back to the kids that are our customers within those schools. Mm -hmm. And since I was inspired to read with comics early on, I decided that I'd love to start a principled-based comic book series that taught principles and it was something that parents could be excited about their kids reading instead of a lot of the darker uh, yeah. more adult themes that the comic industry has kind of gone in that direction of yeah tell me about principle so based what do you mean by principle based like give me an example just meaning we talk about you know character character traits and and honesty and friendship and, mm. and trustworthiness and, mm -hmm. and a lot of those types of things instead of some of the darker themes. Right, right. And so I hired a couple of young guys out of Baylor University. They they graduated a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is the writer and the other is the, the artist. And we started a comic book series. That's and cool. Marlon and Percy are featured in our vending machines with just about every vend. But what, then we've also written... Um, and published five full-length, full-color comics to date. Those can be found at marlinandpercy.com or on Amazon uh, in ebook or Kindle format. And we actually mm. just completed, we haven't uh, done all the edits yet, and it's not available for release, but we just completed 
a 200 plus page children's novel as well. Whoa. Um, Marlon and Percy are a couple of apes. They're a couple of apes that want to be superheroes. And so anyway, yeah. it's really, real cool, really cool story. The artwork is just off the charts. Yeah. And just really excited about that. They kind of are the Bazooka Joe over sticker machines. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, so it's Marlin, M-A-R-L-I-N, and Percy, P-E-R-C-Y.com, right? Correct. Yes. Correct. So which one's your favorite? Comic. Which character or no, which comic? Which comic, yeah. Uh, in our series or elsewhere? Your Your series. <clears throat> yeah, I would say the last one, number five, uh, is the, my favorite to date. And the re reason for that is just because as Caleb and Tyler have grown and have gotten better the last couple of years, I, I mean, they've just outdone themselves on the storyline and mm. the artwork. It's called Snow Monkeys, Snow Problems, uh, Marlin and Percy, number five. Okay. And. Uh, it's about snow monkeys that are ninjas and uh, anyway it's awesome reading the kids love it adults love it and like I said there's five of them available today and we will have a children's uh, novel coming out soon as well love it Matt this has been so much fun thank you so much thank you Jeremy I appreciate the opportunity to be on and God bless man yeah, thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out.